Should we squash the whole bill? Or can we... Let's do the whole bill. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Okay, um, so for the record, uh, Jim Demery, Vice Council, we're doing a markup of draft 8.4 of your committal on pre K. Um, and to save your voice, I'm going to say you don't necessarily have to read the whole thing, but there's the purpose, everybody. Okay, <laughs> yeah, there's the purpose, everybody. Any comments? <laughs> <laughs> Does anybody have any questions on the purpose? What is realign? I mean, I mean, this was to, to change our language from clear bifurcate. Yeah. Now we're more of a hybrid, so this is to reflect that change. Okay, so if we want to talk about that, or we don't want to talk about that. At well, all? What, what is it that's? We, we, I mean, know that we we've bifurcated public, public, public for education and private, mm -hmm. and then. Um, but I'm not stuck on this. I'm just wondering if there's a path towards that, how we can word something in this bill that says we are working towards having the agency of education eventually be responsible for the education or delivery in private and public schools. And then it's, it's, in, the, it's in the bill. Okay. It's on the path. It is on the path. It is. It does it. Does it. No pathway. Just yeah. done. Yeah. 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 Here you go, Doug. I'm sorry, I'm not understanding. Is it in the study committee? No. Okay. It's so at, at, at a date certain, they're bifurcated. They're bifurcated, yeah. but so that AOE is responsible for the educational delivery in private centers, oversees the educational. Yeah, so, so, so the way so it works in this bill yeah. is that AOE oversees both public and private, and AHS also oversees private. There is joint oversight of private and sole oversight by OE of public. So let me just clarify what I'm thinking, just see if it's in here, okay? That eventually, you know, relatively, hopefully soon, that the agency of education will be responsible for the delivery of the educational portion of this bill, the BELLS, the Vermont mm -hmm. Educational uh, Early Ed Standards in both public and private, and that AHS will only be responsible for health and safety in the privates. No, it's not, not what this bill says. Okay. It's not, it, it, that's not the direction this bill takes. I know, I'm just wondering. What it says is, on the private side, is joint regulatory oversight of pre-K by <coughs> AHS and AOE. So Education, they, health, and safety, then. Yep, yep, right. are both agencies right. of the privates. Or it doesn't go as far as you're going in terms of having AOE be okay. solely responsible. And how, I mean, is there any way we could get to where AOE is oversight? I mean, you're using public dollars to give private entities. Um, you know, first, that's one thing. But children in private schools, private pre-Ks, are not necessarily with a licensed teacher. And I feel like there's inequity there. Yes, and that's why we're going to be getting data on to see how inequitable it is. To see, that's what the study, that's what okay. one so of the things out of the report study does. may come where the AOE is then responsible for all the education. That will be for the next committee. <laughs> is there any way to ask that or phrase this so they look at that? Or that we recommend that? Or I recommend it? <laughs> Just I think the challenge to read is that pre-K that's delivered in a private setting is generally, there's no, there's really no such thing as a private standalone pre-K. Mm -hmm. Generally delivered within a broader center. Mm -hmm. right? So that center is regulated 24-7 by AHS. Mm -hmm. The idea of sort of pulling AHS out of that 10 hours and like only having AOE when really it's a seamless, it's a seamless program. We're well, leaving in the hands of, of the experts in a sense to figure that out. And this is where we can get, get a little bit you know, too much to tell them exactly which part of it. Okay, I'll just say this one more time and then I won't say anything and I'll do whatever the committee. I feel like it's in inequitable that there are children in the public schools getting pre-K education mm -hmm. and have access to a licensed teachers, whereas there are children in the private sector who probably are having a fine time. I'm not 
but are not getting the equivalent right. educational delivered, you know, deliverance of educational curriculum from the privates. And I think that's inequitable, and I think it's unfair, and it's public dollars that are paying both of those. Which is why we are saying, kind of, we have guidance that says the teacher needs to be present. We have a lot of interpretations of what a teacher is present for. Mm -hmm. What we want to do is get a picture of what, what's happening in the pre-K mm -hmm. programs now, mm -hmm. and what's the gap to be able to get there. Because if we all of a sudden say, needs to be there, you know, during the 10 hours, all on, there's some programs that will collapse because they're not ready. So we're trying, this is what this report is trying to do. This report back is trying to do what's happening now, how are people interpreting um, present in a program, and what's the gap to, to, to actually make it so that it is, as you would say, equitable. But at the moment, we can't, if we demand that, we will collapse programs, and that's not an intention. I'm just, just one more thing. I, I mean, I feel like in these two reports, it says. I mean, yeah. in this final report and in the um, the 217 re recommended reforms, in 217 it said that. So, yeah, it does. Okay. You understand that usually the main issue is that to all of a sudden require this. A, not necessarily can find people, B, can't afford to do it. Yeah. So you would, you would literally yeah. put, potentially put a lot of places right. out of business. Right, I'm not that's saying everything right. right. I'm not saying right. the right. teacher, I'm just saying the oversight. So it's, we're, we that need they, a glide that, path. Right. We need a glide path. We've right. taken the glide path out because it made a lot of people nervous. Yep. And so we left, we took out the glide path and yep. we said, report back to us. <laughs> And I think we just, we'll, we'll get to that report back. And then why don't you hold your questions on that until okay. we get to the report back? Yeah, I'm okay. not, yeah. I, I know it's, it's hard the equity, equity, it's I the equity issue that is just makes me yeah. crazy. Yeah, go ahead. Equity hey. doesn't happen overnight. Any hey, comments on this for purpose? Through, um... I think we're ready to move on. Okay, all right. Okay. All right, so. Yes, we're not tapping. Well, this is super fast. Do you need to add that third study mm -hmm. up there? It says require reports on, and you've got two out of the three reports that were. Oh, by teachers, oh, about vision and. We're doing that visioning study too. Yeah, yeah. Can I have that? Huzzah! Mm -hmm. Huzzah. <laughs> Thank you. Good catch. Yay. <clears throat> Is that an editor? I, I am an editor. Yes, yes. 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 Every committee should have one. Yeah. 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 We haven't really worked anything real hard this year. Okay, so definitions are here. Uh, the one that we talked about quite a bit is the definition, definition for each child. And we set up the 504 category here. Um, so it still um, allows five-year-olds to do an IEP plan. Any comments on this? And aligns it, aligns it. Everybody <clears> okay <throat> with this definition? Okay. okay. We're not going to come back to that then unless... Private right? pro any comments on the private provider of public provider definitions? We can come back to it if we have a need to. Okay. I'm comfortable with that. Yeah. Okay. All right. Okay, then the, the section here hasn't changed much really from current law. This is the whole thing about um, telling them it's 10 hours, 35 hours a week, uh, 35 weeks a year, sorry. Um, talks about how uh, it's paid by the district of residents, to private programs, public programs. So this language is basically current law with some changes just for clarity reasons. Okay? Okay. When we get into your changes more uh, over here, so this is where you have the notification that the public program is expanding or beginning a program. Uh, that's A, and B, a private provider is, is beginning or expanding a program. That's required, required, required to give notification. Um, any comments on this? Okay, on that. Okay. Okay, there's over here. And then we have a definition in C and line five of what expansion means. Okay. 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 
Then we go into the provider qualification requirements. So the requirement in um, on lines 20 and 21 are the requirements for a private provider. And so, <coughs> uh, so it's not an AC or four stars. That's for private. Private. Mm -hmm. And then you've got the requirement as in current law as we understand it to be uh, about the requirement to have a teacher. So it's basically a reflection of current law. So for a um, for a, a um, service program, um, it says at least one teacher. I didn't say what they do or how many hours. Um, for a private program, uh, likewise, though it does say that they can uh, um, use that teacher to receive active supervision and training. So if we took the three hours out of the family. Yep. Yeah. We went back to current law. law. Um, they said, Tell them, until we get the results of the study, <coughs> and then you can decide what to do next. Any, any comments on that? Comments? Okay. Just, uh, I just don't want you to hear you say it again. Yeah. This is now to better reflect current law. Correct. 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 And, the Correct. and the license is, what kind of license is it? Is it, it either has to be a teacher license endorsed in early childhood education or in early childhood special education? A licensed teacher. A BA, right? Yeah. 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 Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So we're on page six. Yeah. Okay. Seven. Now. So uh, we're, we're all right with that, correct? Uh, okay. Public provider qualifications are again either NACI or four stars, and. Again, current law, employer contracting for the services of at least one teacher who's licensed, and a uh, new requirement, uh, mean safety and quality rules adopted for the State Board of Education. And we'll come on to this later on. We have the requirement that they map to, to the extent possible, map to um, um, a, a AHS requirements for uh, child care centers or private. For the public. Yep. Okay. 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 Then we've got the requir requirement uh, in 2A and B for the Agency of Human Services in A and AOE and B to okay. post on this website a list of providers um, that are qualified. Uh, and a requirement that if a provider is not allowed to qualify, uh, it notifies the agency. So they each, they each post. East Post, yep. yep, and the East and the East have to provide an application uh, if they are no longer in compliance. <coughs> and then the language of building bright futures, so they're going to be, um, you know, linking into these websites and making it searchable, etc. So a parent could go to one place to find this information. I have a call in to building bright futures. Unfortunately, Nick Morgan is away. Um, I'm hoping to hear from Katie Mobs. I don't know if we will get that before. So there's any concerns on this that may need to go upstairs. You just asked about their capacity to do that. Or yeah. To, yeah. <clears throat> do you always name um, someone in this, like, if Building Bright Futures didn't exist anymore, I mean, do you, do you, is it better to uh, define their role as opposed to a specific agency? I'm, I haven't done this, so I'm just, no, it doesn't matter. We can just name them. Okay. Oh, we need to. Okay. In this case, they need to because somebody has to do it. And right. Have to find, so. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, yeah. Then we go into the sub D, which is tuitions, budgets, and ADM. It's a reminder: this hasn't changed very much from the current law. Um, so, this is a section that requires uh, the district of residents to make payments to other providers, um, and it talks about how you deal with that from a budget standpoint, how you count that for ADM, all of that is the same as current law, and the changes here are just conforming changes, really. Um, so, uh, go through here. Um, the one difference to current law that's noteworthy is this line 20. It says a private provider or a public provider that is, is not the child's district, district of residence may receive additional payment. So that allows publics to charge for 
um, pre-K for the additional hours that was not permitted before. So if they have, let me, let me clarify, so if I send my child to a program that has a half-day program. Which, which, which program? A, 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 a public, public school yeah, yeah. nearby yeah. that's not in my district, <clears throat> and they have a half-day program, do I have to pay for that? Uh, they can charge you for the hours in excess of the 10 hours. Okay. Yeah. That's up to them whether they yeah. charge you or not. Yeah. Um, and then we added this new subdivision five, which is a requirement to um, use uniform forms and processes, which are developed by the Agency of Education. And then there's the now standing clause on on 16 that allows them to not use those uniform forms fully if uh, it would be unduly burdensome or costly. Okay, forms, everybody. Any comments or concerns? About what? Forms. Un universal forms. Uh, Corey, a little later we, we describe kind of how we want them to come up with the new forms. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. 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 Yes. <clears throat> okay. Good. Um, then um, we have this uh, limitation of liability provision here. So this one says here that the only responsibility of the school district is to pay that tuition to their uh, provider. Um, and uh, the school district should not be responsible to monitor uh, the administration of the pre-K program by that provider. It should be immune from liability. Um, for that provider's administration of this program. So that's saying basically the AOE does not monitor the private program? No. Nope. Is that what it's saying? No. Nope. Oh, that's not a thing? No. Nope. It still does. It just says the public school districts don't have to monitor private programs. So if something bad happens at that private program, <clears throat> if they want to come back and sue you, you let my child go to that program, mm -hmm. this says, I'm not responsible for what's happening, correct? Correct, yeah. 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 But is the AOE still <clears throat> monitoring that kids are getting taught certain AOE, it doesn't, it doesn't change anything in here related to, to our decisions about monitoring. AOE still monitors both private and public programs. Okay. Yeah, yeah. yeah. this is just making sure that the school district don't get sued. Okay. Um, yep. so essentially being forced to contract with these providers. It's okay, Serena. We, we will work through it. And I do want to give you an opportunity to ask you questions. I'm also, I am also paying attention to some time. <laughs> so uh, this section here, E, on regulatory oversight, A is one is unchanged from the previous draft, which is the Agency of Education has sole regulatory oversight of public pre-K programs, except to the extent that it participates in CCFAP or in um, STARS, in which case it's under AHS for those program elements. Okay. So as soon as you take CCFAP in your building, you bring the Agency of Human Services in with you? Only to the extent of, of, of those program requirements. Those, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And four stars. And then here is where we talk about DCF. So DCF and the Agency of Education should have joint regulatory oversight of private pre-K programs. Yeah. And at one point we tried to be more specific about it, but it made it really clumsy. Right. And I, I mean, I'm just going to say again, I maybe I, I was the only one that heard from superintendents, but they find this very cumbersome. No, no, they, they find AHS being involved in public pre k cumbersome. Not private. <coughs> this, this is what the superintendents have been saying. <coughs> so this takes AHS out of public. Okay. Out. Sorry. I'm yeah. sorry. Unless you have an after school program where you're accepting no, yeah. CC that, that's different. Yeah. But no. Okay. okay. Thank you. Yes. Yep. Um, and then we've got uh, joint rulemaking um, um, by the two agencies. And I won't go through all the rules. We've been through them a number of times. I'll scroll through them though uh, slowly. If you've got comments on the rules, just stop me. Uh, so. I'll just see what they're about, though. A is about um, uh, helping private providers uh, be qualified by giving some teacher supports, so public programs helping private uh, with some teaching supports. B is about uh, providing 
opportunities for effective uh, press participation. Um, see is a process basically around how you enroll your children in pre-K and get counted toward um, ADM. Um, and then D is a process about the annual statewide tuition for pre-K. That's the $3,400 a year. Uh, e is around um, including a cost for your budget for your public pr uh, program. F is around um, um, uh, reporting uh, to the AOE of your expenditures. Uh, G is a, a, around an administrative, administrative process for complaints in both the private and public uh, sectors here. And these are all really just technical changes that we're doing right now. We're just redumbering them. Well, there's some changes. But you, yeah, the numbers have changed here because so much has underlined very well yeah. across that. But, yeah. um, and then um, H is the monitoring, which is um, um, goes along your regulatory oversight philosophy. So uh, this requires uh, that, that there be monitoring of public programs only by AOE. They be monitoring of private programs by both AOE and AHS, and then they, they jointly report back to you. Excuse me, the results of that monitoring. And the, the requirements for what is monitored on line 16 is the same as it has been in current law, with the one change that you've added on line 5 here, um, the reference to social and emotional development. Um, I is a process to document progress for children. Uh, in pre-K. Um, J is to establish health and safety requirements for public and private providers. Let's just um, make sure everybody understands H. H. That's, that's, um, H is the monitoring, yeah. Yeah, the, the monitoring, do you understand that what we're doing here with monitoring? Any questions on that? You have to have a comparable system. AOE monitors, um, uh, public and both monitor private. Just sometimes in those things where it says publicly funded, it gets people confused, but that's yeah. just the public dollars that are going to the private program. Yeah. Okay, we good with that? Just can you help me understand on the ground, how does that work like with the AHS and the AOE both monitoring privates? How, how would so that if I'm look? a public program, I'm yeah. running a public program yeah. and I'm not doing any CC yeah. type stuff, yeah. the monitoring person is going right. to the agency of education. Right. I, I understand yeah. how it's set up, but yeah. actually how, I mean, do teachers from the, from the privates the and the publics get together and kind of decide <coughs> on how children are doing? I mean, how is it monitored? Um, the, a lot of that is through the test. test scores and things like that, not the, t the, the, the um, early learning standards, TS gold is how individual students are doing. Okay, so both of them would look at those test scores and both of them would come up with a rem remediation plan? Well, this monitoring a lot has to do with, it could be health or safety monitoring. Do you remember when when, um, yeah. when um, Kate Rogers came in and presented the monitoring, that's an updated monitoring? But they'll also be doing educational monitoring. Yes. Okay, together. I'm yes. just trying to figure yes. out how that's going to work. Yeah. Yeah. Some of that is called decimal. Yeah. Okay. But, but everybody's required to, to participate. It's, it's in rule. It's already, it's, okay. there, are th there are things that go much deeper later. This is kind of the overview. Over okay. okay. So we're good with H? <laughs> okay, we're through H. Um, we talked about I. Um, we talked about J. That's about K. No, we didn't talk about K. Um, case is a, um, they have to establish a process for remedial action, which could include sanctions and penalties if the providers fail to comply with the program quality requirements. Okay. So we heard a little bit about that from K. And then L is new uh, to establish a process to verify the public and private providers satisfy and continue to satisfy the program quality, quality requirements. Does that help? That, does that one help right there? Yeah. And then uh, three here says that in adopting these rules, um, they should be aligned, except to accept there are compelling reasons that they shouldn't be aligned. Mm -hmm. Can you just say phone call
Um, okay. F and G are unchanged. Uh, current law. H is unchanged for current law too, except for, for some performing changes so that allows geographic regions. Uh, that's, that's there. And that takes us to section two. Wow. All right. Yeah. Section two. Yeah. 18 page, 19 page, section one. Okay. Section two um, is uh, taking the public programs outside of uh, DCF's jurisdiction. So we are now out of volume 16 and we are into volume 33. And that's right here. Except to the extent that they uh, participate in, um, that's interesting, this should be a change here. Uh, number six says, uh, this takes them out unless they participate in CFAP. I think we also have to do with stars here too. Um, right. um, we don't could you go back up just a little bit, Jim? Yeah, sure. <clears throat> so this is saying that you don't need a license or a registration to operate a child care center, and then we have a list of exemptions. Yeah. So if you're a public provider taking CC that money, you don't need a license or registration as a child care facility. So we need to get out of that unless? Um, no, I think we want the exemption. What are you saying to take out of this? So you only have a license for that anyway, so you wouldn't have to have that. Um, so this is saying if you're a public provider, um, you let's see, you don't need a license. It's an exemption. Yeah. Unless you participate in CCFAP, then you do need a license. Oh, you need a license for that? Mm -hmm. And do you need a license for, for to, to get, do stores? Do the stores? Uh, well, that would be a policy decision. Do you, if there's a public provider, um, who's using STARS to qualify under the pre-K program, would you want them to need a license or registration as a child care facility? Or would you like to keep them outside of that? They still have a school board and a principal and a superintendent. Yeah. And it's yeah. like sort of out of the scope of yeah. pre-K yeah. anyway. Okay, so do we have a language change? Just a okay. quick one here, just clerical. Should um, so under section two B, there's just two things. Shouldn't it be one and two, not five and six? So I'm, I'm just wondering. So on page nineteen, line fifteen, mm -hmm. shouldn't that be a one in parentheses because there's just two subcategories to B? The, I guess I'm just confused about five and six. The ellipses on 14 signify that language has been omitted. So one through four have been omitted because they aren't relevant to the bill. So we don't show the language in the bill. So, I see. So you're, so there's there's one through four in this that'll be there in the statute. Correct. Yes. We're just adding five and six and you're not showing. Well, we're adding six and five we're making a change to, which is why we're showing it because on line 19 there's an add and added. Okay. Yep. So we've seen that one through four in a previous bill. It's existing law, so you might not have seen it recently. <clears throat> I'm just curious who was exempted, but that's fine. We could pull it up and look at it, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I guess we're not changing anything there, but that, that explains it, thank you. Okay. All right, so um, we will think about whether we have changed the language on page 20 to deal with um, SARS. Um, Okay, going on in section three, again, this is the thing up to the definition of uh, pre-K. So this now is just cross-referencing um, the definition of pre-K children as defined earlier. So we don't have, we don't have definitions in two places. Um, and then we got the requirement in section four for the section of education to develop these uniform forms and processes on uh, before March 15th, 2021. And they have to do that in collaboration with private pre-Ks, um, pre-K coordinators, um, which are representative of um, different geographic regions in the state. So, any comments on that? Okay. Section five is health and safety. So, 
Um, section 5 is health and safety rules. This requires that the Agency of Education <laughs> We're supposed to be wary of people that bear gifts. Oh, that's right. Thank you. Thank we'll you. We'll bring our afternoon wine, maybe. <laughs> okay. How the safety is being aligned? The the rules for AOE are being aligned to the rules for, for private the private side. Okay. Uh, again, unless there are uh, compelling reasons, they should be different. And then we get on, on this report uh, on availability of qualified pre-K teachers. This is uh, finding, findings and purpose section, which we won't read through, but I'll just pause here to let you read through that, to see if there are any changes. Is instruction by qualified educators who use evidence-based practices within intentionally designed early learning events, which is similar to the language that came from here. So that's what we're that's what we're, we're shooting for here. That's our that's our our goal. Okay. However, here's the however part. <laughs> you said we're gonna talk we're gonna answer Chris's question later? Yeah, I think let's just okay. get through sort of the findings section here. Findings. Okay. Um, however, we recognize that there are challenges. So this is for the quality that we hold, however there are challenges. Therefore, what are we gonna do about it? We're commissioning a study, okay? So we're looking at, we believe in high quality education programs delivered by qualified teachers. We have a problem, we're not there yet, therefore what are we going to do? This is the what are we going to do part. Okay. So let's go through that. Okay, so we're on B. Uh, maybe we should read the, this um, yeah. that language yeah. here. So it says, on before December 15, 2020, the Agency of Human Services and the Agency of Education shall study and report <coughs> to you. Um, one, the number of teachers in the state who are licensed and endorsed in early childhood education or early childhood special education, we define that as a qualified teacher, okay? So first is the number of them in the state. Two is the number of private pre-K education programs uh, in the state and the number, number of qualified teachers employed by or contracted with those programs. Um, Three is the average number and range of direct instruction hours pre-K children receive from qualified teachers employed by or contracted with CERN-based child care programs and family child care homes. Qualified pursuant to um, the section we went through. And we did, do we have a definition of direct instruction? I think that's an understood concept. We don't have a definition. I assume that people know what that okay. is, but um, I don't know if you want. Yeah. Uh, four is the number of public pre-K education programs in the state and the number of qualified teachers employed by or contracted with those programs. Five is an estimate of the um, additional number of qualified teachers that private pre-K pro education programs would need to employ or contract with if those programs were required to use the services of teachers for direct instruction. Six is the financial impact to private pre-K programs and families of requiring those these programs to employ or contract with teachers for direct instruction. Seven is if the supply of qualified teachers 
um, to staff private pre-K programs is less than though is necessary, um, or the financial impact of this requirement poses a significant burden on those programs or families. Uh, recommendations on how to achieve the goal of having those programs provide direct instruction <coughs> to students by qualified teachers in a cost-effective manner. And eight, taking account your goal to have pre-K education be delivered through the implementation of high-quality, effective, direct instruction by qualified educators who use evidence-based practices within intentionally designed early learning environments. Recommendations on how many hours of direct instruction by qualified teachers should be required in a public school that offers pre-K education, uh, that's needs a line there, B, a center-based child program, and C, a family child program. Uh, child care home. And D, uh, sorry, C, a child care co home uh, where the operator of the home is qualified as a teacher, and D, a uh, child care home uh, where the operator of the home is not qualified as a teacher. Okay, Serena, so, you know, this is where your questions are. So this is getting to, hey, we really think that a program should look like this. Wait a minute. <laughs> doesn't look like we're there yet, what are we going to do? We're going to start to find out mm -hmm. what's the gap. Mm -hmm. How many are needed? How many are there? How many hours are they doing? What's the supply? And how, if we don't have that and we've got a ways to go, how are we going to achieve the goal? This is what this thing is going to say. If it looks like we've got 15 years before we're going to get there, mm -hmm. then maybe we need to figure out something we might oh, need to I do. Oh, I thought you said it looks like. No. Okay. Let's say, let's say we've got a lot of preschoolers that have to grow up, go to college, and want to be pre-K teachers. So I'm just wondering if there, it would help to have any if, uh, questions in there about a provisional license. Like, what, where could a teacher be teaching and be getting well, probably, professional development? In that terms probably of, be probably how to achieve the goal. That might be something that would okay. come up. Yeah. And the other question I would have you is, have, you have to yeah, go for two just, minutes. Why don't okay. we get, why don't we get through the last one? It's okay because yeah. I, yeah. Okay. I, yeah. you can sit for a few minutes, but I gotta go to the So we can talk about that. Yeah. Okay. Yep. Um, so the next section is a new section. Um, it's another report by the same group, by the two agencies, by the same date, uh, December 15, 2020. Um, and includes their five continual vision for this will change for pre kindergarten, I should say. And then the capacity of. Um, kindergarten programs to take on four-year-olds. We'll uh, change. And then three, <coughs> um, bridging the gap. You have some changes on this. I haven't really yeah, had time to look at that's fine. I, I think there was just, uh, there was a concern that people would think that when we were talking child care, we were only talking about, about preschoolers, but we're actually talking about the whole gamut of pre-K. I mean, of, of child care, so I don't know if there needs to be language that includes, you know, what, infants and toddlers or... What gap is being bridged, though? Um, we're looking at, at, oh, and worker supports should be, um, we changed that too. What did we talk about? You said supports for working, working families. Yeah, yeah, supports for working families, and yeah. Parent engagement. Parent engagement. Parent engagement, yeah. Um, we keep running into this problem <laughs> in looking at, um, pre-k program filling that gap is there another are, are, do we need to be looking at the broader view i know we had a study we, we had the study done i think building bright futures or there was a um what was the study what was the report done a few years ago do you remember what the blue ribbon commission yeah 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 we're we'll reviewing that so i think you might have you have i think you might have some language that might help with that that I'll, get, we'll get in a minute because I know you have to go. Okay. Unless you can quickly say, can you quickly say what it was there? Or we'll come back to it. Will you get it? Just let us know. <laughs> okay. And then section A is this report um, by the advisory group, the um, one created in Exit 173, in collaboration with a bunch of folks in uh, pre-K um, education providers in the private sector, pre-K coordinators, pre-K teachers, um, looking at two things. First, how to ensure that uh, a student who attends pre-K out of district of residence gets special education services uh, without cost to the parents. Um, and two, how to ensure that we're not overpaying for pre-K given the fact that the um, census grant under Act 73 covers pre-K and there's a separate 
provision of statute that covers uh, pre-K, um, uh, the triple E grant. So looking how to how to deal with that um, fund those two funding sources. Yeah, and, and a little bit more on that, just in that the difference between pre-K is calculated and the way um, K-12 is calculated and between 40, 60, and then they do the ADM thing with pre-K and it ends up being very little money and not coming close, which is what Carolyn Parker was talking yeah. about. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, and then this section nine is your new section, but the grant program, we went through this this morning. Um, I've heard a couple of edits on this already. Um, so this would create, um, this would basically be, what would, would be recast here a little bit as seed funding right. to start, um, to create a position of right. uh, a pre-K coordinator on a regional basis. Uh, regional basis being uh, across three SUs or more. So this has to change a little bit for language, which I'll take care of. Um, the administration of the program is agency of education. What's not here and what needs to come in is um, talking to a rep who have been calling me for this uh, um, testimony. Uh, the grant will be a two-year grant. Uh, the first year of the grant will be um, Ninety thousand. Um, yeah. Uh, first year of the grant will be ninety thousand dollars. The second year of the grant will be thirty thousand dollars. So one twenty total over two years uh, per applicant. Remember, al applicant has three or more SUs, um, and the total appropriation will be four hundred and eighty thousand um, dollars. So that has to be filled in and changed a bit, which I'll, I'll do, but that's basically, I think, where you... Just thinking, that's, that's four. That's, that's four grants. Mm -hmm. yeah. And then the effective date. So, um, I need to go. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, I can revise it so, okay. uh, for tomorrow, so we can, you. you can take a vote on tomorrow. <clears throat> Can you have any more notes? Maybe I'll just, uh, yeah. Thanks. Thank you. Okay, thank you so very much. Sure. Okay, so we're going to take a vote on this. Oh, right. Yeah, are you going to look at the I had a question. Yeah. Um, backing up to Chris's question. Yeah. So I just yeah. want to make sure I understand. So this bill, which um, echoes current statute, is silent on the number of hours yeah and the specifics of the the licensed teachers who are you know present at or providing instruction in or coaching or whatever in the privates so is it that i just want to understand that is it that 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 was later promulgated in the rule and that's where that appears or has this practice just evolved in the field where does the whole where is that written down i think it's in and then i understand that public schools hire Licensed teachers just period. So, so it's, it's in rule, rule? Okay. 2605. All right. Thanks. Um, and that, what we have here doesn't change that, right? right. Correct. Right. So why don't you just read it so people know what it says in the right. rule? Okay. Um, it up whole okay. Uh, a private pre qualified pre kindergarten uh, education program operated in a licensed center based program shall employ or contract for the services of at least one teacher who holds a valid Vermont educator license with an endorsement in early childhood education or early childhood special education, 10 hours that the licensed teacher is present shall coincide with the hours of pre-kindergarten education paid for by tuition from districts. So the teacher present. has to be present for those 10 That's hours. In the center. Basis. Yes. And we don't the, know what present means. The operator of each registered or licensed family child care home approved as a pre-qualified uh, pre-kindergarten education program shall ensure that one of the following requirements is met. One, or A, the operator holds a valid educator license with an endorsement in either early childhood education or early childhood special education, so meaning that you know, the owner Grandma is Kate there, present, is the but is the license holder. Um, B, or uh, the operator employs or contracts with the services of a teacher who holds a valid Vermont educator license in early childhood or special and, um, for at least 10 hours per week for 35 weeks annually. Well, apparently there are a lot of those. 
10 hours that the licensed teacher is present shall coincide with the hours of pre-kindergarten education paid for by tuition from district. Or, C, the program receives regular, hands-on, active training and supervision from a teacher who is licensed. I'm not going to say kid one. It's all the same. Uh, at least three hours, three hours per week during the 35 weeks that is paid for through the district. Mm -hmm. So you can be present for 10 hours, or in the in the homes, Correct. three hours of active yeah. coaching, Correct. training. Yeah. Okay. Chris. Did I think that helps? That helps. Okay. So there we go. It doesn't change any. Right. It doesn't. Yeah. We're just gonna look at. Yeah. Yep. So we rule to rule. How are we doing, everybody? I'm good. What are we voting? Um, I was going to wait until we got the completely redone one. I wanted to make sure we had a little bit of a chance for if, if, if the uh, advocates had a chance to speak. That would be great. Um, I want to remind everybody that this bill is going to another committee. Mm -hmm. Okay? Mm -hmm. And there are things that, I mean, there are certainly some things on the report back that it might, they might have some great ideas to add to that. I don't know. Um, in terms of the oversight, they'll probably there's an opportunity. They might they have opportunity there to make changes. So um, I, I'm realizing that we don't have a perfect bill. We have some questions that are still there. It will go through two more committees, and we're pretty much out of time. And I really want to get this to them. So if, if it was possible to get it. Why don't we take a struggle, struggle on what we have right now? Yes. Supporting the bill? Yeah. Send it over. Okay. Okay. Um, it's voted out for a word. Yeah. Yeah. Is it safe to assume that the other two committees were here the same testimony we heard from the bees yeah. this morning? It, it, it's, safe to, it's safe to assume that people will be up in that committee wanting to testify. Uh, we will also send one or two of us up to present the bill to them. Um, in terms of being able to get back with those changes, I don't know Jim's schedule for today. I know that I have um, another committee I have to be in in a little bit, and then I could make changes after that, but we've been kind of working collaboratively and yeah. going back and forth, so I'm not sure, Isabel. I appreciate that, really. Thank you so much. Yeah, for So is he in the Senate? Uh, yes, and he's pretty much there with the rest of the afternoon because they are. Oh, already my dead. Lord, proficiency things. Learning. Oh, my wow. goodness. They're doing structured literary. Yeah, they're not. That's a short Oh, oh that's right. That's short a short long. Long. And it's the waiting study. <laughs> oh, yeah. Okay. I know. It's miscellaneous. It's a miscellaneous that has waiting on it, I think. Um, and help. So. So it looks like uh, tomorrow morning, then, we will have the, the final copy and we'll, we will take a. a a vote. Sarita, are you here tomorrow? Yeah. Everybody here tomorrow? Yep. Thank you very much. Um, did you want to speak to the bill? At 15, for people who are out meeting with the Secretary of Education will have an opportunity to speak if that's possible. Yeah. It can be very brief. When will they be? They can be here for 315. 315. And what about you? Do you want to speak? Um, sure. I have that language that you have. Okay. <coughs> Okay. Great. Can we do it now? Yeah. Thank you. Um, just uh, related to our conversation earlier, sorry, Sarah Kenny from Let's Grow Kids, um, about the vision and capacity report. Mm -hmm. um, the, the language that I have thrown together very quickly for your consideration is just saying that the report shall build on the report and recommendations of the Blue Ribbon Commission on Financing High Quality Affordable Child Care. And you might want to also include the report of the Building Vermont's Future from the Child Up Think Tank, which grew out of the Blue Ribbon Commission, and include representation from the agencies at both of those tables. So just not losing track of all the work that has previously been done on this visioning right. question. And then I would also recommend that that somewhere in the guiding language for that report that you um, require them to work in consultation with stakeholders somehow. So it's not just the agencies in the room coming up with the vision, but that they're talking to other folks. It, it might actually be something I'll leave to the other committee. 
Okay. And then I just had one technical question that might actually be a question. I'm not sure. On page um, 24 in the study about the licensed teachers, the report on availability of qualified kindergarten, pre kindergarten teachers, mm -hmm. there is a reference. <coughs> Sorry. What was that? Page 20. It's on page 24, line 1. There's a reference to um, 829C1A as amended by this act, but I think that's a reference to when you were changing the requirement for licensed teachers in classrooms. So I just wanted to double check if that reference is actually, if there's still a change in the bill to that section. Or if it needs further clarification that you're talking about <coughs> that vision of requiring direct instruction in the future. Well, yeah, and it's referenced again on uh, line 9 and 13 and 7. Let's look it up and see what it says. It's referencing as amended by this act, so and I don't think that this act is any longer amending that definition, but I don't know. Just a, just a question. That's a, that's a general question. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Thank you. So it's possible that we'll leave that language to the other committee to do what they want to do. It really, I, I think in thinking about that, it was just thinking, as we're working on policy for pre-K and child care, you know, what's, what's, the inter, what's the interaction between all of those? Mm -hmm. And are we looking at what's happening around the state mm -hmm. and reading what's happening around the state. There are so many different interpretations of how to do this. Yeah, yeah. And there's definitely a, a movement in the field from birth to five toward yeah. having increased credentials and having folks who are well qualified and professionally prepared and teaching young children from birth to five until they get into the public school system or until they're in kindergarten. So and there are, we want to move toward that. Call commissions that you know are, are aligned, assigned to the governor that are related to birth to grade three. Mm -hmm. So that's another question about how broadly those should be looking. Um, I also I don't think I mentioned earlier, but I um, we totally support the new pre-K coordinator grants, mm -hmm. and we talked a little bit about mm -hmm. making sure that that's clear that it's incentivizing new regional coordinators as opposed to funding the ones that are already there, which might be nice too. But if the goal is to have them statewide, yeah, thank you. Thank you. Tomorrow morning, I'm going to have to go Tomorrow morning? Tomorrow morning. Well, what's All right. Maybe the end of the day. <laughs> Maybe the morning. Maybe you're open at too soon. It's a night day tomorrow. I don't know if we're about to break, but we just we need to be back here at 3.15, right? Who? Okay. Who is? Who? The three. These. These. The governor's seat. Yeah. 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 You know what? Let me show you. Uh, we do have, let me, this is, this is kind of cool. Um, there's a student coming in to see the governor tomorrow. Oh, yeah. And um, let me see if I can get this up. Did you ever get those dancers? Coming? Yes, those dancers are, the, the, yes, they are coming. Good. Um, singers. Singers, yes. Singers. And they're, they're going to speak to us, too. We're going to get um, a special, a special um, opportunity for them to speak to our committee. But I, this uh, young man who's... Um, to the governor uh, tomorrow. Um, can you switch me over? Yeah. 
folks to listen. Yeah. All right. So I've invited this little fellow to talk to us. Dyslexia associations says about 15 to 20 percent of grade school students have dyslexia. They say the core difficulty with dyslexia mm -hmm. is word recognition, reading, fluency, spelling, and writing. Channel 3's Connor Cyrus is live in our studio to explain, even with all those barriers, one very boy is proving anything is possible. Andrea Carter Somayini is a fourth grader and with the help of his mother wrote a book, The Boy in the Bat. The book is about a boy named Bill with dyslexia. He's nervous to read in front of his classmates, so he runs away through a series of adventures with a new friend at the bat. And a sword that reminds him to never give up, he's able to overcome his fear, proving that anything is possible. Mom Rebecca Somayini says that this is very important to know. Dyslexia is extremely common, and uh, there is help out there in the community. There are many people, many programs there to help your kid learn how to read. And the, pro or the book is just to let, let families know that they're not alone. She and her son Carter have been working for over a year and a half to get this book perfect and published. Coming up at 5.30, hear from Carter and why he thinks this book is so important for everyone to read. Alexandra? It's a sale so extraordinary. It only happens once a year. No. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So at the total wholesale. Mm -hmm. So at any rate, um, I've invited him to come in. Nice. All right. Um, we, we need another influx of kids in this room in a big way. It okay. always seems to make Can we ask him what, he, what he, his recommendations on our, uh, our literacy bill? Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> we can certainly ask him what's help. Can I share that I went to the prison in Northern State yesterday um, and spoke with eight gentlemen sitting in a big circle with a teacher. Scary, they had my bio with my picture all out there, so I'm going, oh boy. Uh, I couldn't have snuck out because they would have known who I was by that time. Anyhow, they all sat around and they had some very wonderful questions. They're all going to vote. They've all contacted their, their town clerks. They're planning on voting. Two of them will be the first time that they've learned that they will be voting. Mm -hmm. um, one young man has been in and out of a um, couple of child homes, <laughs> and he's only just 21. So uh, he, he's been in Woodside twice and back and forth, and I didn't share, or they didn't share what they were therefore. Um, but I asked a question. I said, I hope I don't embarrass anybody, but would you gentlemen tell me, can all of you read and comprehend and spell? And they said yes. And I said, does anybody have a struggle with dyslexia? And I had two that raised their hands. And that it was very hard for them trying to get through school without having to have a fight <laughs> because they were different than the rest of the kids. And when I told them that we, you know, the 63% and the reading and the, uh, they couldn't believe it. And I just said, well, we have to do something about it. That's all there is to it. After all these, you know, 200 years of learning how to read, and we still don't have it. So, but anyhow, it was a delight. The scary thing is, is that, um, they, as they were leaving, they all shook my hand, and they walked out and they told their teacher, there were two of them that said, I'd like to run for office. I said, do your time. I said, we did have a gentleman here who had done their time, went back to school, and uh, I said, he's done very well. And I said, you can too. You can do whatever. But the teacher was so excited that they actually were listening and were really, really interested in what was going on. Of course, they wanted to know, how much do you get paid? Right. No, and no. why <laughs> and Why did I choose to go into to government politics? And um, I must like it because I've been here 10 years. And I just. They, they didn't say that. You said it, that. No, they said, you've I been can't. doing this. Yeah. Well, it said on my bio that this is however many years, and te it's 10. <laughs> and. Uh, so they were very excited, and they're going to continue this class. So on the next class, they're going to ask me to come back again. And, oh, nice. And yeah, we'll nice do that. Someone. And I stole your um, or, origami little people. Um, one of the gentlemen has a lot of problems with 
being able to be centered, he's nervous. And I saw him sitting there and he says, ma'am, he said, I'm not ignoring you. I can't sit here and do nothing. So he made me a family of cranes and they're the littlest, teeniest things I have ever seen. And he said, it's just something I do. And he says, everybody in the prison, I think, has one. If they haven't stomped on them or strung, you know, strung them up, they, he was joking. And, uh, but it was a lot of fun. It was, it was really a lot of fun. And if you have the opportunity, go. Share your, share your abilities. Go to pick a prison that's near you and go in and ask. They all have community high school mm -hmm. in Vermont, and, or they should. And uh, just say you'd like to talk to them about literacy or whatever we're talking about. So. That's great. Thank you. Mm -hmm. We are going to have a redraft of um, literacy. Um, <coughs> trying to balance a few things. It's challenging. And then this afternoon, I think um, Lynn and, and Dylan, you're going to go next door yes. to follow the um, school construction. There's a little interesting thing. Um, I saw Rebecca Ellis, who used to be a legislator here, and she now works for um, the Welch's office, so guess what I always talk about when I see her? Uh -huh. Federal aid for yes. school <laughs> construction. Help. So I felt she told me um, last week that she thought that there was some steam that was being picked up on that. And so I told her some of the things we were doing. And she asked if we had any update on, on what kind of projects were happening in the state. So I gave her everything that the, I gave, I checked back with the bond bank right. and um, sent that information about our bonding and then our bonding that's going now at the local level. So. She said, this is fantastic. So I'm like, oh, good. <laughs> maybe people use it. Maybe, maybe they can help, help move. move it. And they're voting that health care bill out now. So I'm going to go up. Oh. I'll follow that. Oh, OK. OK. okay. okay. And the, uh, the, you mean the health care bill? So we have to tell us about that bill. I don't know. really into the There was. Bill. There was just some interesting testimony. Yeah, but I'll be back to take this. So we're, yeah, we're, 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 we're off until then. Um, Uh, yeah. I really appreciate uh, your ability to keep it designed to the sections of the bill to make it a little easier for us to, uh, we don't have our attorney in the room at the moment, we don't have either of our attorneys in the room, um, so it's very helpful if you can organize things to identify the sections of the bill that you're talking about. Hi, everyone. Jeff, Jeff Francis, Executive Director of the Superintendent's Association. We've been working with, um, as a collaborative, the school board, superintendents, principals, and council special ed administrators. And we've been trying to uh, stay with you in your work as you looked at drafts 3, 1, 6, 2, and 8, 4. And we came in this morning with testimony on 6, 2. You were listening to a walkthrough of 8.4. Um, we were asked to testify, or asked to testify, because we know that you're preparing for a vote. Um, so we went back to uh, our offices at Two Prospect Street and looked at, um, at draft 8.4 and have uh, an interest in commenting on the bill. Now, the chair has asked that we be very specific with respect to the sections, but we did not organize our testimony that way. We organized the testimony thematically around the things that we were interested in, that we stated as priorities, and um, are gonna comment that way. I've asked Sandra Cameron, who's, who's with us, um, to try to honor the request of the chair. When I talk about provisions within the bill, she's going to tell you the section that they're in. Okay. okay. So we'll just have you talk about the provisions of the bill. We're going to take a moment so we can find that section. Right. And what we're what what we'll do, and I realize that you're on a tight timeline, is if we're not successful in that approach, we'll come back to you with the sections referenced. Okay. Okay. Good. If that was okay. Um, the the two general comments that I want three general comments one um, we're very appreciative of the fact that the committee is turning into this issue as you've heard from us 
ad nauseum. This is a bill that um, we've been interested in since its passage in 2014. <clears throat> The folks who we work with in the field have been challenged by the um, implementation construct of the law. We think that changes to the law are necessary, and we appreciate the fact that you're tackling those changes. Um, the second thing that I'll say is that I know that Kate Webb um, joined some of you in terms of visits to public and private providers of pre-K through the fall and early winter. And I know because of the people with whom she visited uh, that she learned a lot about the variety, variability, and multitude of local uh, partnerships that have arisen. So the, the interest that we have in this bill does not speak to what's not happening at the local level because we think by and large the folks at the local level are working well together. Um, and that's something that I think you've thematically heard in this committee. And then the third thing that, that I would be remiss uh, if I didn't bring up, because it does speak to some of the testimony that I'm going to provide, is that um, we were surprised uh, at the testimony that was offered by the Agency of Human Services and the Agency of Education last week, particularly after they had issued the 27 report for improvements to the pre-K delivery system, which called for um, greater equity of access for kids, it talked about the challenges associated with dual oversight, um, and it raised the issue of um, the credentials for uh, the teachers who um, are in contact with kids in the settings, whether they're uh, home-based, center-based, or school-based. So the, the testimony that I'm going to offer is thematically on those points, and it won't come as any surprise to you um, that we're going to offer the the testimony that we are. So, in the bill, there is a study about the implications associated with higher teacher credentials. And it really speaks to a couple categories of interest. Yep. Can you take us to that part, Sandra? Mm -hmm. So, page 25. Starts on line 16. So, right. Um, okay, so there's two things here. So what you're, you're on the section seven study, the vision and capacity part, or the other one? No, I oh. think the study that we're speaking about is the study that is the report on availability of qualified pre-kindergarten teachers. That's, That's section six 21. on page 21. So there's a lot of data that's collected here, and I think it's data that's intended to substantiate what we already know, which there's a shortage of qualified pre-K teachers, and that if you evolve into a system where there are increased obligations for center-based and um, home-based providers to provide access to these educators in these settings, that that's going to be challenging. So. I, our thought is that rather than reiterate the problem and substantiate what we think you're going to learn is that the focus be on addressing that issue rather than proving it. Um, I'm not sure exactly what the language would say, but we think that AOE and AHS in their capacity as the leads on this um, Act 166, which they will continue to be, that the focus of that section ought to be more on how, not, not why you can't or, or the implications of that, but how to do it. And I'm not sure what the language would say. We didn't have to get to that yet, but. I would, I would say that I would ask you for that language to get to us before the end of the day. Suggested language yeah. though, right? Because I'm not yeah. sure I agree with the premise. Yeah. Okay. So, so create capacity, is that, is that what you're asking? I mean, my, what I think the testimony said on the problem, on the issue was that uh, research shows that um, uh, working with a, with a licensed educator is preferable in terms of outcomes, and I would add parenthetically literacy. We know that the, these are education fund dollars. And we know that um, there are uh, 
there's a belief, which I have no reason to, um, to dispute, that to evolve to more stringent requirements, even over a five-year timeline, would be perceived as burdensome both from a financial standpoint and from a standpoint of are there enough educators available. So, I mean, that could be studied, but you could also say we accept those things as true. What are we going to do about it in terms of getting access to educators in these programs? Um, this so study's got. I don't think we need a baseline then. Maybe you need a baseline, but it seems to me like you could you could turn this study as much into how you address the problem you anticipate as identifying the problem in its scope. So we can try to get your language on that. Yeah, I think I'm hearing that the committee believes that we need a baseline. Okay. Is that correct? Yeah. I don't. But we don't. Yeah, what you're saying is what you want is, is to put the focus on how to uh, reach the goal of, essentially to, to really be specific, how to reach the goal of 10 hours of direct instruction from a licensed teacher in a private setting. Yeah, and I, and I think if we were going to, and again, we didn't have a lot of time with this draft, so we're going thematically to the points we made. I think that because AOE and AHS are confident that everything's going to get worked out by them, that they ought to be the ones who do it. I, I would just say only I, I do feel that we need to retain the, the baseline info but if you if you guys are feeling that this doesn't correctly address the solutions you know right after section five is the place to beef that beef that up sure and, and again I, I want to be I want to stress this and it's not I'm not a tremendously uncomfortable person uh, situation for me because I've been in the witness chair before these are these are not fine this is not fine point testimony this is <coughs> this is our response to 8.4 based on the time we had mm -hmm. which was basically from the time you concluded this morning till we all went to a meeting at the AOA mm -hmm. at one o'clock so yeah. we're doing the best we can yeah. um, the second thing that I want to say is we're appreciative of the um, bifurcation of responsibility for AHS and AOE with regard to oversight there there the 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 um, that oversight is still inextricably intertwined so what section are we going to now sure Can you? I'm going to go to point three next. Okay. I mean, there's not species. It's just scattered now. So Sandra says it's scattered throughout the bell. So let me just be real clear thematically about what it is we're interested in. Because AOE and AHS will continue to have to work together in a wide array of issues associated with the implementation of the act. Um, we would like to see the AOE and AHS have some kind of an ongoing feedback loop so that they are in contact with the field with regard to the effectiveness and efficiency of the implementation of this act. So right now we're functioning as intermediaries at the association level. We come here and we say, special educators, early childhood coordinators, principals, superintendents, school board members, think that the implementation of the law under the dual agency oversight construct is not working well. The testimony from AOE and AHS was that they had a new monitoring system, they've rewritten the rules, and they have new paths forward in terms of how they're gonna work well together. Let's take that on face value, but let's, in addition to the changes that you're making here in terms of the partial bifurcation, the, um, the realignment, as it were, that AOE and AHS go right to the field, public providers, private providers, and they create a feedback loop. And that's not funneling it through building bright futures, not funneling it through um, let's Grow Kids, not following it through the Vermont Superintendents Association, 
let's ask the AOE and AHS to create a feedback loop and then present to you the evidence that the improvements that they've made are in fact in place. So that's the second. <coughs> I think, yeah. Well, I think you could, I think it would be relatively simple language that says, as part of the implementation of the act, AOE and AHS will develop a feedback mechanism so that public schools and private providers, you can include parents if you wanted to, have a way to convey their, their uh, experiences associated with the effectiveness and efficiency of the implementation of the act. And that wouldn't happen in the migrant? I think that the monitoring system is intended to cite, look at program deficiencies. I don't think it's got anything to do with the satisfaction of either, I could be wrong about it, but I don't think it's got anything to do with the satisfaction of the public schools or the private providers in terms of what their experience is trying to navigate the system. What kind of system are you looking at? Envisioning like a... I, I'd ask them. First of all, I'd ask them if they think the concept has merit, and if it does, it's, it's something they could do. But there's every kind of survey form available right now. And I'll, 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 here's the thing. We were of the belief that the best way to move forward with this bill was to give the Agency of Education oversight for the public schools and the Agency of Education oversight for the education portion of the private delivery system. And you're, you've made some headway with respect to that, but it still has got, even in the construct of this bill, there's an integration, understandably, I think, because when Act 166 passed, everybody was of the belief that this dual system was going to work well. And now here we are at various intervals saying that it's not. Well, and parts of it have worked well, from what we understand, but not all of it. There's been, kind of late, certainly. Well, we had a, I mean, you had two secretaries in 2017 say that it ought to be separated. And we've got, and we had late testimony, late testimonies from AHS and AOE last week coming and saying, we you know, keep everything basically the way it is. So what we're saying is that, I mean, that's fine. We've got good working relationships with those entities and organizations. You're making progress with regard to this bill in terms of the construct of the bill. I think it's true that there, that there are still going to be experiences for public schools and private providers, presumably with both agencies. And in a modern era, it ought to be reasonable for the AOE to get feedback and AHS feedback on what the experiences are of the people who they're providing services to. Okay? Um, the third issue was equity and access for children with disabilities. And okay. Hold on a minute. Yep. <laughs> so this bill um, uh, remains that issue as it were to the census-based advisory group. We had a lot of conversation in the short time we had this morning to talk about the um, wisdom of that. Um, I think that equity and access for children with disabilities uh, is a core principle of an equitable education delivery system. We've known since the passage of 166 that that was a problem, principally with regard to equity and access to services for children with disabilities who may, for reasons that are um, legitimate, useful, and make sense to the, the families of those children, they want to have portability. And portability um, is a big aspect of this bill. So we think that there is a fundamental issue around how to provide services to those children and give them the same opportunity that any other children would have. The census-based advisory group has its hands full with regard to the implementation of 173. It's got its hands full with regard to supporting the implementation with the Agency of Education. And I've got a feeling that it's going to have its hands full even more so when you delve deeply into the waiting study. So we don't believe that the right entity to examine this issue of equity and access for children with disabilities would be the Census-Based Advisory Group. 
we can imagine a construct where we do again have representatives of AOE and AHS convene the appropriate stakeholders. I'd go so far as to say they could determine the appropriate stakeholders and then work on this issue. I had a conversation with the chair before we came in here. That it is a tough issue because it's an issue that basically bends the construct of the current way that we provide services to kids with disabilities in a construct that has been stretched downward into a, um, a partnership or collaborative between private providers and public schools in a, in a construct that provides for portability. So it is a thorny issue and it's one that um, is going to require, I think, access to resources, um, in ways that the Census-Based Advisory Committee is not well situated to do it. So we think it ought to be done because we think it is a core interest with regard to this issue, but we think it ought to be um, the responsibility of, of other entities, and I would suggest to you that AOE and AHS could be charged with that. Um, the fourth one is one that is not touched on in the legislation at all. But when we talked at, uh, in our meeting earlier today, we were, we were mm -hmm. examining uh, draft 8.4 for a response to our core principles. And we realized that um, we've left a core principle out. And this, I think, is through the iterative process of trying to track the various um, drafts, and that is, it goes to the question of how do you get increased contact time beyond 10 hours for children most in need, those who live in poverty, those at risk of developmental delay, and those are English language learners. And that, that aspect of this bill has been with us since the passage of the bill, right? So Ned Kirsch, um, who, as you know, fortunately passed away last year, uh, unfortunately, in 2016, he, he was examining the, um, the delivery of 166 in, the, in his um, uh, uh, Franklin West Supervisory Union, and he said, you know, these things are going okay, we need a new work in these areas, but the thing I'm really concerned about are the children who don't have access even to the 10 hours because of their circumstances. And for those who do have 10 hours but need more, how do we get it for them? So I think it would be reasonable for you to say, Jeff, you know, that's not in this bill currently. We're not going to put it in the bill. But when we talked in response to draft 8.4, we raised the question, if this is a, if Act 166 is intended to improve access to public education and outcomes in public education um, starting with pre-K in a, in a system that's funded by the education fund, can we do more to get access to kids who have, who need more than 10 hours? So maybe that we should take with the committee upstairs. Maybe if this bill progresses, we ought to bring it up otherwise. But we talked about it today and I thought I'd, I'd, I'd bring it up with you. And then the and then the fifth one, um, and again, this is sort of ancillary to everything that I've comment on, commented on so far, but thematically it's on, totally on point with what this committee has spent a large amount of time on in this session already, and that is how do we make sure that Act 166 and universal access to pre-K is aligned with your short and long-term literacy de development initiatives? So you've got 166 right here, and you've got literacy legislation right here, and you've got 173 right here. When you think about pre-K as being the foundation to a child's education overall, and that is in, you know, uh, in conjunction with what you do with children birth to three, then it does make sense that as we examine Act 166 and, and its implementation, that we ought to be thinking about how Act 166 and its implementation conforms to your interest in literacy, which takes you right back to the first point, which is 
contact time with the most well-qualified educators. So that there you could say, missed that too, we get your point, if you do get my point, and, and uh, thanks for bringing that to our attention. Now it's going back to A4 specifically, the, um, the, uh, the provision, which is the streamlining provision for the expansion of public programs when deemed necessary by local school district officials. Sandra's going to find that for us right now. Thank you, Sandra. Well, as we look for that, so our testimony is that we, sh we should dispense with the uh, notice on agenda um, because the implication there is that it's quite similar, albeit without the repeated hearings that are currently in Act 166. We think that it would be better if the public providers and the private providers just had the same 60-day notice requirement. Communities in Vermont are relying heavily in some regions on public providers because there's not enough private providers. And, then, and it would be sufficient in our belief that we simply say to all providers, we believe you're going to act responsibly. You're only going to add capacity when you need to add capacity based on local determinations. Once that determination has been made, it's sufficient to notify your partners with 60 days advance notice. The, the notion of, you know, you, once you post it on an agenda, you need to notify all your partners within the region, presumably so that they can come in and talk about it at a school board meeting. Well, one calendar day. So the notice requirement for um, regular meetings in Vermont right now is only 48 hours. So basically, you warn a meeting on Wednesday. Plenty of schools do it ahead of time. The meeting's on Friday and on Thursday. Your program partners get a notice to guess what we're going to be talking about this tomorrow night. We, we think it's better and goes more to the equity um, of implementation of this law and equity in terms of how we consider the public providers and the private providers that it just be 60 days for everybody. Um, and then finally, and this is the last point, and I may ask Tracy to speak to this. So to they, then you might as well say you should notify someone by either July 1st or something. Why is that? Because they aren't going to be starting until September, right? August. Not, whoops. Yeah. Uh, Jay Eccles, director yeah. of BPA. That's not necessarily true. You may start. January. You could, yeah, depending on, you know, an influx of students or something like that. So 60 days is what we would propose there. And then finally, although we address the, um, the issue of ensure equity and access for children with disabilities uh, in my testimony above, uh, Tracy Sawyers was uh, quite interested in making sure that there was a study um, through the Early Childhood Special Education Task Force around, I think, all forms of funding support for um, uh, pre-K for children with disabilities. And if Tracy's willing and you'll grant permission, Chair Webb, I'd like to turn to Tracy so she can talk right. about that. For the record, Tracy well, Sawyer's Vermont Council of Special Ed Administrators. I can re-give you, Sandra and I testified on some more specific language here, uh, just Valentine's Day, I think, a few weeks ago, so I could give that to you. But I think the issue of looking at access and funding, because that's going to be key and there are some opportunities and where we are around the funding piece. Are you and talking about kids on IEPs or not on IEPs? Yes, I'm talking about children with disabilities that need services, IEP services, are, outside of district. Yeah. yeah, and that it's about access and how to do that, but also the funding. It's looking at the AAA grants. It's looking at the um, census-based funding um, block grant, pre made, possibly pre-K through 12. Um, looking at the current reimbursement model. So I think there's pieces that need to look at that in conjunction with the access piece. And I can hand this to you, this language again, and share that with you. And then yeah. finally, what I'd like to say is we realize that um, this is a fluid process. And we appreciate the fact that you have allowed us to come in and testify on draft 8.4. Um, we recognize that when you consider the testimony that we gave today, some of the points we raised 
you may be able to do something about, some of the points you might not, some things you may agree with, some things you may not. The, the test that we applied when we prepared to come in and talk to you was whether or not we were being true to the issues that have been brought to our attention for the last five years by the people who we work with. And I am very appreciative, and I think I speak for my colleagues when we say that you've brought this discussion to this point, draft 8.4, and I also feel that we would not be doing our jobs and would be remiss if I didn't come in and speak about these issues just the way I have today. So. Given the legislative process, um, I'm already way behind in getting this bill upstairs. This bill will go upstairs. It may go to Ways and Means. And if it gets out of this building, if it is chamber, it goes to the Senate. And as we say, sometimes these are things you just take to the other body. That always hasn't worked very well for me, um, <laughs> but I understand that that's how the process works. Yeah, and I'm, I'm looking at, at the things that, that you would like. I think some of them are pretty easy. I think, for example, um, not using the Census Based Advisory Group, um, moving that to AOEAHS, that seems to make sense. That, Probably theirs? No, it doesn't make sense. Oh, no, it, it makes yeah. sense. I agree with you. Uh, for part of it. Yeah. Um, I think they're, they, they're the ones who need to study and come up with recommendations for how we deal with portability. Uh, it, it still seems to me that the Census Base Advisory Group is perhaps the best place to be looking at the funding mechanism as we move to the Census Base model when there's already a categorical grant program for pre K special ed. Which we're hearing is not, not, not great. You don't have a problem with that remaining with it? No, I mean, I, like I said, we, we did our best with regard to the comments that I made. I understand you're going to work on it. I, 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 yeah, and I realize that time's limited. Um, anything that you can do to give consideration to the points that we raised, we appreciate. Okay, so in terms of the report back, you are okay with gathering a baseline, but you're suggesting that perhaps there needs to be more on what we're going to do about it. Yeah, and for me... And we would say a plan to respond to the... Yeah. Within a time period. Yep, yep, yep. I think that would be good. Okay. In terms of oversight, you're talking about some kind of ongoing feedback mechanism beyond, beyond monitoring? Yeah, I mean, I think that people do surveys all the time. They know who the licensed providers are. Yeah. They could just say, What's your experience been with uh, administration of this program by AH, AHS and AOE? I mean, one, one of the challenges that I've observed over the last five years has been a communication challenge, and I think that that is in evidence in spades. And, and uh, I think that if AOE and AHS are uh, at the dawn of a new day in terms of how they work together to implement this program efficiently and effectively, and I'm paraphrasing now, but that's the testimony you heard, then I think that that's great. Let's go with that, but let's get a, let's have a feedback loop. I'm not sure how to do that. <coughs> well, and, and, and to, be, well yeah. say, to be fair, there's nothing in here that prevents them from right. doing a feedback that. loop, nor prevents anybody from acting from the well, them to do it. If, and do, they do, they need, do they need legislation to do that? Well, I mean, this is the, I haven't, didn't go back and check the, calendar, but I think I've testified on this bill every year since 2016, and we're here raising the same issues. I think one of my, one of my problems with pre-K uh, is, again, access. We're not serving our kids. We're serving some, not all, particularly with disabilities. I don't know how we I mean, there's a lot of issues there. There's transportation issues. There's poverty. There's so many things that interfere with this. Uh, <coughs> I, I don't know how we fix that. I really don't know how we fix it. Ten hours. Huh? Ten hours. You have to be there. You have to get there. Ten hours is, doesn't work for working families. Ten hours is not being other than that. I just mm -hmm. remind us that we're really yeah. just trying to kind of yeah. make the program 
as, as sort of is work better. Yeah, I mean, you want to vote tomorrow, too, right? I, I'm sorry that, that I, I can see, I can feel in my face that I'm, I'm showing some frustration. So I, I well, but, yeah, yeah, I mean, with all that, and, that's fantastic, but I. And, it's not fantastic. I mean, no, no, and I don't mean to be. I don't mean to be disrespectful. It's, you know, this I think is our fourth time testifying on this bill. Yeah, well, we're on draft eight point three. So. Right, and 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 AOE and AHS came in. Right. When? Friday. So here's the deal: the, the goal has always been to stabilize this program. That's all that's we're trying to do is stabilize it for now. And there needs to be a plan looking for the future. Just stabilize. Stabilize what we can. Is, is this a done deal? Is this a 10-year plan? No. It's not. But it was designed to help free the public schools from dual oversight, designed to allow public schools to be able to expand if they wanted to, designed to bring forward what we learned from the field that pre-K coordinators are really valuable and it's working and we need to figure out how to scale that up and um, always to maintain that a mixed delivery <coughs> model is what we have now and that we can't do it without a mixed delivery model and um, being adversarial between the public and private is, is getting us nowhere and so I just I just want to we need to get to the point where we have got um, <coughs> teachers with a kind of qualification that we can understand means something. And at the moment, we don't have something that we can say means something, unless they have a certified teacher there. Um, it's not to say that in those private programs they're not doing some wonderful things, it's just that we don't have evidence that there is without having a teacher, a person that has credentials. So our, our goal is to stabilize. We're hoping that out of this we'll be able to start looking at, there are states around the country that are coming up with some amazing ideas. And, and we're stuck going like this. And I'd like us to get out of being stuck there. Because this is going to go upstairs and it's going to be this again. At the same time, everybody I know wants to do well by three, four, and five-year-olds now and paying for three, four, and five-year-olds in the future, which is why we have a, a visionary piece in there as well. I think some of these that we, we can fix, um, so they're not, not too big. Um, we'll talk about whether 60 days works or not. Um, we'll talk about, um, uh, we'll get the language from Tracy about the Early Childhood Special Educator Task Force. And um, I'm going drinking. <laughs> now that I should say yeah. fantastic, though. Yeah. Yeah. That's my opinion. What's the effect of David drinking? What's the effect of David immediately? <laughs> yeah. no, I'm sorry, I have a, an unfortunate um, humorous side that I hate. Oh, it's just typing away. <laughs> um, no, why not? Can I ask a yes, um, you just may, a please, um, ask something. So I want to just make a statement about one thing. One is that when I was an early ed teacher, what I heard with children that were struggling had a double dose, like where they went to the same kindergarten program in the same day and did the rep repetition had better outcomes than longer hours. So that, that's just one thing to think about how to structure that. So you brought up the, the, the issue of literacy and special ed and pre-K and I, you know, this is why I'm concerned and I expressed this morning that the AOE is not monitoring kind of the, edu the, the delivery of educational program in the private school. And what I hear is, that the VELs, the Vermont Early Learning Standards, are, are supposed to be being implemented in both the public and private. And when I read the VELs, there's a whole section on literacy, you know, for four and five-year-olds. Um, and that's why I, I, I'm feeling I want some assurance that that is being done. I, I know it's probably being done in the public. 
I, I, I don't know if it's being done in the private. So that's, that's, it that's is, all. It is. It is. Just, just do we know that? that? I mean, how do we know that? So what, so so it's, so it's really they they so what do you need for a for for uh, what kind of convention that's happening? Uh, probably for the AOE to go in um, and look at the curriculum and the standards and meet with teachers or you know get some. No, no. What, what, I'm saying what's going, what's going to we keep telling you that the VELs yeah, yeah, are in place and are right. being monitored right now. Right. You don't seem to believe that. In the privates. It's right. not like yeah. I don't believe it. I don't know. Do you know for certain? I mean, do, yes. we, do we have a report of In outcomes from the, the private? Started, right? so, so we know that progress monitoring is done, TS gold, right? Yes. We don't know what curriculum looks like across the, all the settings. We don't have a way to measure that. We don't have on-site monitoring of what it actually looks like. Sorry, but they, they, do, they, they do TS goal is a measure that actually is sort of sets how they're doing on the those in a sense, sort of, doesn't it? It measures child progress. It measures child progress. And that data goes to the AOE. Yes. And we don't have we have not seen right. that data. We've not seen it analyzed. Mm -hmm. no. So maybe if that happened, that would be really helpful. To see the data. And yeah. as you know, we've had incredible data problems with the AOE. Yeah. I don't know. The AOE is in the probably so anyway, I just was thinking that that link seems like it's already there, the literacy and the pre-K. Um, and it just would be good to see some data on how kids are doing in the, yeah, in the privates and the public. It's <coughs> Emily Simmons, Agency of Education. Um, I know we keep talking about the monitoring system and saying it's not fully rolled out yet. It'll be fully rolled out at the end of March. Yeah. It's color coded, and I'm observing that everything in yellow is the monitoring of bells. It's the third um, bucket of things that we monitor in the monitoring system. Did you send that? I did send it to you yesterday. Oh, oh, oh yes, you did. Yeah. So, do we have the data? I, mean, I know you're monitoring. Do we have the like outcomes? That would be the TS goal. Would be the measurement of the outcome. And we have that for privates? Yes. Okay. That's all I want. <clears throat> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Jeff. Thank you. Thanks, Jeff. I, I do apologize. I think I owe you with the apology because I said um, if I keep talking about this, it will end up in what's that called? Lola? You know, the, reading. Yeah, I've been in it once already. It didn't end well for me, so if you keep kidding me, I'll probably do <laughs> Thank you. Hey, when stuff comes to the legislature, it's not easy. We know. We know you're doing your best. We're doing our best. We believe AHS A and AOE are doing their best. So, so you're saving seven dollars okay. for everyone. Price we're, 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 we're not going to take up issues like that. Yeah. <laughs> and? So. Conversation team. Um, let's go, kids. Did you have anything more? Um, I just always like the opportunity to say on the record that I agree with almost everything Jeff Francis just said. <laughs> um, Put I, that in at what's it called? Finally. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, um, Bifurcations, I actually, I think they raised great. Can you comment on the 60 days? That's what I want to look into a little more. I feel like that might just be an ongoing topic as the bill continues moving, because I just don't have a sense for how it actually plays out on the ground. Thank you. I am coming back. Okay, if you folks could help, I'm happy to um, go work with you in the cafeteria and see if we can get this hook up with the lawyers to see if we can get the right language. Um, Oh, Any yeah. other comments um, oh, from the team? No, I don't think so. Okay. Okay. I was getting distracted by the vice chair. Did you just ask for more comments from us? Yes. Did you have something to say? No. no. That, was, that was constructive? I, I want to know what our return on investment is. Uh, <clears throat> we'll take a few years. I don't know why. It's all right. Mm -hmm. it I'm not sure if you're going to be able to do that. I'm not sure if you're going to be able to do that. I'm not sure if you're going to be able to do that. I'm not sure if you're going to be able to do that. I'm not sure if you're going to be able to do that. I'm not sure if you're going to be able to do
So where we are at the moment then is um, any thoughts on, on what what Jeff had to say in terms of we're looking at if I could have that paper that would be really helpful. Um, did Jeff just take it away? Um, his, yeah, but, the, um, one, the one that he was the one that had your bullets on it. Yes, we should be able to do that. Okay, I'll, I'll I'll give these to you, right? Okay, I'll just to speak to it right now. Do you have any copy of this? I, I would just say in cases like that, so in reference to the testimony, yeah. Yeah. there are some very important things yeah. that were brought up, but they're, they're, they're really big. They're, they're, like, is, is 10 hours sufficient for our kids who are most in need? I don't think that this bill is going to solve that without just sort of saying somebody needs to study that further. Yeah, we're not addressing that this time. That, that is a big issue. This has always been a tweak, not a revision. And the alignment with literacy, I think, trying to make that happen in the two pieces of legislation now, I think, would derail any progress. I think it's happening. And it's happening. Yeah. I mean, I, I don't, you know, I think it is happening. I just want to see if we do it. Okay, so we're going to look at moving Central Space Funding Advisory Group. We're going to talk with you about that language. Okay. Sound good? Mm -hmm. I was yeah. glad to hear the news. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Um, report back. We'll make sure we have the baseline language um, that we're, we're talking about, but also some recommendations. I don't know if that's in there or not. No, no, it's in the findings before the study. It says yeah. that the goal is to have direct yeah. instruction. So look at that. Or some of this is just moving on, and we'll we can earmark those for another committee to take a look at. Because I, I can't hold this bill here any longer. No, it says taking into account yeah. the General Assembly's goal to have pre-kindergarten education be delivered through the information of high-quality, effective, direct instruction by quality educators. Right. So that that will be looked at. Um. Yeah. The fifty-day thing. So I'll, I, I'll speak to that. I, you know, I think that the idea of the sort of one day or two days at an agenda is supposed to, be, is to provide a clearly defined, concrete way, trigger, to say, we need to start having a conversation. Obviously, it appears on an agenda item that's way before, 60 days before an expansion is going to take place. Uh, but I, to me, the whole goal here was to say, the two sides need to start talking. I would hope it would be, as, as they're noodling the idea, a school district would say, well, let's talk about it and make sure we're not killing the private programs around us by doing this. Yeah, 60 days is not enough. Well, it just seemed like it was easier to say, hey, we're talking about it. <laughs> Here's the link to the Footbridge Forum notice is what seemed easier to me, but I'll, I'll hear from the school boards. Okay, um, so I will go work with these folks and the lawyers and see if we can address some of those concerns. Casey, do you have a thought? No, I'm just looking for it to get this out tomorrow. Yeah. No thoughts. We're going to get this out tomorrow. That's even exciting. if it's not, even if it's, it's not perfect. Yeah. Can we vote now? Yeah. Anything else tomorrow? Tomorrow, um, we have a um, couple things going on. Um, 8.30, like could it be in here to do pre-K markup? Okay, to do, not mark. This is, this is going to be the vote. When? Okay, tomorrow morning, 8.30. What, what time? 8.30, can you be here? Oh, Mine's going to be on traffic in Burlington. You got storage coming. 8.45. Thank you, Casey, for saying that. I have to get involved in this whole time. We have to have a new agenda. New agenda. Yeah. Um, just do this so who, 830, 830 is a hardship for whom? Everybody. If there's, if there's traffic through and if my kids drive their feet, that's off. That urban area. Okay. Urban. I got a much longer time with these two guys and I'm not raising my hand saying it's going to be a hardship. <laughs> I, don't, I don't have kids to drop off. Okay. <laughs> no, I'm, yeah, they, they, they sleep in and... Okay, so I will do, I'll, I'll move that, we'll move that. Um, no, we'll, we'll start at, we'll start at nine with the boy to that, which is probably what we need. Um, and then, um, then we'll just jump right in after that, but then it will give us a half an hour, which isn't enough. Well, this is all our, all of our own time. I mean, that's yeah. 
Yeah. That's literacy. That's literacy, and we've got to do literacy. Okay. And then we've got. Um, Uh, I don't think so. Maybe it will be okay. Yeah. Just Maybe make we'll do that one. That one would be 15 minutes. Yeah. yeah. We'll do that 15 minutes. So, 9.15. Um, so, everyone's hoping you're listening. Okay. So, 9.15, um, we'll do pre-K. Oh, 9.15 is the boy. 9.15 is the boy. 9.15, we'll do pre-K. And then we'll follow it up with um, literacy. And then we will, um, we're going to be hearing from uh, Lynn and Dylan, our next door, listening to what they're doing with our school construction. Um, they have been working on the uh, survey. Um, of schools and uh, the language for that. So they're going to be presenting that language to us. Um, and we'll hear from John Carroll on that State Board of Education. Then we'll go and have a wild log floor. Um, so we're definitely doing cannabis tomorrow? Yeah. I think we are. I think we are. Yes. Yes. Oh, I well, think that's right. Yes. I think there's no way there. there. We'll be there a long time. Yes, Rita. Just um, just I'm just thinking out loud here. What harm would it do to assume that there weren't enough teachers? What, as opposed, at, in, in terms of going in that direction of looking for a solution? What harm? Like, why do we need that data? What harm would it do in just finding a solution? Kind of, you know, looking for a solution in the bill. Not a solution, but a path yeah. to get more. Do I mean? Do we really need that number? I mean. What if we just assume there aren't enough teachers? What harm would it do to, you know, think of a way to build capacity? Yeah, figure out the this is from the person who always wants data. Yeah. yeah. I know. It's amazing. But I'm thinking what harm? I mean, what difference does it make? I mean, if we just went and kind of looked at how to build capacity, if there's enough people, there's enough people. If there's not enough people, we're like a little ahead of the game. <coughs> I think about it. You don't have to answer me, but I'm just wondering about yeah, that. Like, yeah. what harm would it do to do that? You're right, but about the data. But I'm just looking at where we were at one point where we set a goal, an aspirational goal, to have licensed teachers in the, in the school. Yeah. And then we had a rather large upset about that. Yeah. So we said, okay, you know, this is going to run programs. Let's go back and see what that means. Yeah. So then we said, let's get the data on where we are now and see what the distance is to get there. Mm -hmm. And that's how we ended up with this. And then people wanted us to take away the aspirational goal of five years from now. It will be, yeah. which for me felt a little bit like a death, but, mm -hmm. but um, gave that one up mm -hmm. and said, we'll just do this and report that. Okay. I just <laughs> I think we're done.